Well, let me uh, thank our two discussants and, and uh, open up the floor for uh, more questions that can come in. Meanwhile, I'll think some more about the answer to your uh, <laughs> your question, Mahmoud. Um, yes, Jim. Are there Jim any long-term consequences for other uh, nutrients when you start removing two and three times the uh, the grain that you were before? In other words, you know, phosphorus, potassium. Are there replacement issues there? Let me take uh, a number of questions. We'll just kind of integrate those and then uh, discuss them so I can, uh, can respond to them. Yes? I'd be interested to know uh, who did the trials for the trees in the millet fields over what period of time, how they quantified the data. Okay. In the back? Yeah. Uh, the, the maize yields increased quite dramatically, but the other yields uh, didn't, and maybe went down, and so I, I had. What about rotations? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. Good point. Yes. If all the crop stover is used for either animal production or biofuel production in Iowa, what does that do to the soil structure and fertility? Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay. Well, let's let's. Uh, Oh, you didn't have a question. That's very, you're, you're waiting that for kind the, of the powerful uh, one, I'm sure. <laughs> well, let, let me um, uh, address a few of the questions with regard to acacia, acacias and then um, ask my colleagues to further. Um, the issue of um, maize yields versus yields of other crops. Yes, indeed. The real, um, uh, the real positive effects, um, uh, sustained positive effects that we're talking about are very well noted for maize, millet, sorghum, and other cereal crops. For the leguminous crops like soybeans and cowpeas, generally the response is just about zero. It's, it, it's, it's neutral, uh, which may be expected because they are nitrogen fixing themselves. So um, statistically there are ups and downs, but basically the, the, the long-term yields show about a zero response. With cotton, uh, it's zero to a slight reduction. And that's due to greater um, uh, the uh, vegetative uh, growth of the plants, less bowl from forming uh, under the canopy of the trees. So that's the general response. Um, and um, I think a couple of uh, people have, have asked about the, uh, the issue of crop rotations um, and their importance in Zambia. So I'll ask uh, uh, Collard to address that one. Um, on the question of soil fertility, um, indeed, um, the uh, soil fertility in association with the canopy of the trees of these systems is generally um, much improved. Uh, double or triple the uh, nutrient contents of NPK, uh, calcium, magnesium, micronutrients is, is generally seen in those conditions. Um, however, and I think it's an important point that you're probably alluding to, Jim, is that we're not looking at this as a is a replacement for the use of fertilizer. This is basically a means of jacking up the potential of the system and make it more attractive to use the appropriate rates of fertilizer like nitrogen, phosphorus, and lime so that one can sustain those yields over long periods of time. So although you're producing tons of, of nutrient-rich biomass, you're not going to be keeping that system going indefinitely um, without the use of other uh, supplemental fertilizer, particularly top dressing nitrogen and phosphorus for, for, for peat efficient soils. So it's not, a, it's not an organic agriculture uh, system per se, it's, it's a means of attracting farmers, and I mentioned 80% of farmers in Africa use no fertilizer. So getting them engaged in the use of fertilizer means increasing fertilizer efficiency, which is what the system does. Um, you were asking uh, uh, about the, the nature of how long the... Uh, the uh, yeah, and over what period of time. Uh, yes, and, and the, res the, the research on this particular species started in 1952. And uh, Oxford Forestry Institute published a monograph a few years ago with 700 published references on this topic. So it is quite surprising how little is known about this, I suppose, Perhaps the majority of people in this room may have never heard of these systems, um, but it is the case that uh, the, uh, the science is there, but the actual bridge, or, or crossing the bridge to um, uh, large-scale upscaling it, it has, been, uh, has, been, has been a problem. And now competition, we have... The competition for 
uh, between biofuels, livestock, and soil conservation? Uh, I think you should answer that one, Carlos. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> answer not, but just acknowledge that it's a serious trade-off. And I think that's one of the reasons, for example, why conservation agriculture frequently is not adopted by smallholders when they have animals. And I think the whole research and how much of that bioman has to be left on the ground versus fed through the rumen, and obviously how you handle manure and bring that back, it's a, I think it's a still a big empirical question, but we'll have to deal with that more and more, particularly if so, second generation biofuels really takes off. No, I agree. Well, let's do another round, and Uma is with us now. I do want to question now. Uh, since this is known since, you, you say, since 1952, uh, why oh, didn't it take off earlier? <clears throat> I'm often asked that question. I think the, the fundamental, uh, there are two fundamental issues. One is the mindset of Western agriculture. I mean, this is so dramatically alien to uh, Western agriculture. And of course, these systems cannot be used in the United States, for example, because your growing season is too short. You don't have a year-round growing season where you can actually have the pr principle of, of reverse phenology successful. So agriculturists in Africa, for example, have been trained in Western science. That's all, of, all the bachelor's and PhD programs are all we are Western oriented. And these systems were actively discouraged for the last 50 years. I mean, not just neutral, they've been discouraged. Uh, farmers have been told to clear their fields. Uh, projects have been based on the uh, imperative of clearing fields of trees to grow crops. And although the African farmer recognized these systems and nurtured these trees over the generations, it has not been achieved. Uh, it, it has not crossed the line into uh, recognition by Western agriculture. That's number one. Number two is propagation systems. What you saw in most of these pictures were natural regenerated populations of these trees. The tree seed was present in the fields due to livestock uh, spreading through the agricultural landscape. And when it came up, farmers nurtured the trees, protected them, and produced these agroforests. But in large parts of Africa, you don't have the trees, and therefore there are no trees in the, in the system. And propagation has always been a problem because it's a, there's a unique constraint or set of constraints to producing the seedlings and, and planting them out in the field. Uh, that has been linked now over the last 10, 15 years by a whole series of research. And now we can confidently, as they're doing in Zambia, propagate with hundreds of thousands of farmers um, the simple growing of the seeds and, and establishing them in the, in the crop fields. Uh, next question. Yes. I have a question. Uh, I have a comment. I work at the Pacific Islands, and agroforestry systems have been in use for close to 3,000 years as an integrated system that incorporate the livestock, and I think they could be an excellent <coughs> model for other parts of the world, and um, particularly these breadfruit-based agroforestry systems. I think that the, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. I think we need to look at parts of the world where the systems work and are still functioning. Yes. That's under higher rainfall area, significantly higher rainfall than what we've seen here. Absolutely true. And uh, some of you may know the famous book by Russell Smith, uh, professor at Pennsylvania State University, who wrote a book in 1929 about perennial tree crops, the future of American agriculture. Well, it never went that way so far, but maybe in the next century we'll be seeing a, uh, a revisit of, the, uh, of, of that vision. Other questions? Okay, uh, let's have this uh, gentleman here. You mentioned the presentation uh, on Zambia that 25 to 40 percent of the maize planted by smallholders was abandoned. Can you elaborate on why that was and what the factors that were involved in that? Great. Also on, uh, on Zambia, the uh, question on cover crops, how important oh, they were. Yeah. And also, uh, if I understand from FAO colleagues, especially on the mechanization front, that a key factor was kind of improvement of uh, implements to, let's say, facilitate uh, conservation agriculture that took time to develop. But I, I'd like to get your take on that also. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, uh, maybe I start with the 
uh, why 40% of our planted area was abandoned. Uh, the most uh, driver for that has been the weed infestation. Um, in, in the quest to try and uh, produce more, uh, when your production efficiency is and your capacity is limited, so we've had people trying to plant more than two, three hectares, and they are overwhelmed by weeds because uh, they have just a short window to plant weed and everything. And then you realize by half uh, uh, the way down uh, the line, they, they can only do maybe one and a half hectares. And then they don't have fertilizer also to boost uh, the rest of the crop. So mostly it's because they waited for the rains to come and want to do all operations within a short window. And they got overwhelmed with weeds. This is why I think uh, the uptake of um, appropriate use of herbicides has just shot. Last year we recorded up to about 500% increase to a point where we ran uh, short of uh, herbicides. And this summer has now attracted a lot of private companies uh, and also agro dealership for networks uh, coming around wherever we are promoting conservation farming to see how they can uh, promote judicious use of uh, herbicides. Uh, the other reason was uh, purely the uh, livestock crop interaction, which with communal grazing uh, they couldn't uh, handle if you don't have fencing and uh, the like, so there was that conflict. Uh, the, the, the cover, yeah, the cover crops, yeah, yes. Now, uh, like I said, um, in, in Zambia, we're trying to promote uh, uh, food legumes. Uh, we did other the oil seeds, uh, but uh, due to the poor uh, marketing, they are not picking up. So what we've done is to bring in food legumes, uh, cow peas, uh, groundnuts, and uh, that we have seen it is uh, very popular because one, it is helping to cover the, the hunger period. Uh, we have a unique uh, uh, scenario among smallholders in Zambia where during their peak labor periods, that's when they have low food stocks. So uh, cow pea, for instance, comes in handy within the first uh, month of the rain season. By the end of January, February, they're able to reap from there. So it has become very popular and uh, they can do quite a lot of it and that is what actually works well as a cover crop. Uh, we have seen in some areas like for instance I think uh, I saw a Malawan colleague here and in Tanzania trying to shift uh, some cover crop or some uh, dry stover to take to the farm. Probably that could work for a hectare but if you're talking of a slightly bigger area like our uh, uh, oxid farmers uh, that will, will, the economics, uh, I think, couldn't work. Uh, yeah, so the uptake and also the uh, uptake of crop rotations really has been driven much as the utility of the, the type of cover crops you want to use and also the, how the market is developing around those cover crops. So that's what we're trying to do. Then I also wanted to attempt quickly why the slow takeoff. Yeah. I think uh, you're talking of poverty-stricken small-scale farmers whose immediate uh, need is to put food on the table. Now, uh, talking of someone to plant a tree whose benefit will start showing 10 years to come, sometimes may seem very obscure. But what we've seen is uh, over time, people have started seeing the, the benefit. Instead of actually shifting to try and open new marginal lands, they've seen the benefit of uh, uh, doing all these things spontaneously so that uh, they are able to start getting a bit of food now and over time they are building on the soil fertility and there is a bit of permanency in their fields. Okay.